Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> uh, thank you, Christina, for uh, reading that uh, special verse. I'm sure um, most of us are familiar with these uh, special passages. It encompasses uh, the um, true meaning of the character of God. Um, through this passage, I uh, shall try to uh, attempt to deliver uh, God's timely message uh, for us all today. Um, I'd like to welcome our guests and friends as well. We are glad that uh, you uh, are here with us celebrating this special day. Um, I pray that God will continue to shower us all um, with His loving grace and mercy. <clears throat> As we all know, uh, we are celebrating Father's Day uh, tomorrow. And uh, we get a good treat that we are celebrating a day in advance. Praise the Lord. As uh, you've seen in the um, slides, um, we uh, pause for a while and thank um, to recognize all the wonderful things that our earthly fathers um, done, doing, and it's continually doing for all of us. Um, we recognize the sacrifices that they did and continue to do so, um, bringing food on the table, provide us a shelter, protection, encouraging advices that help us overcome our difficulties. Our Father rejoice when they see our first step when the child uses for the first time the potty, the first bike ride, be there on games like soccer, basketballs, and many more. There are endless lists of things that uh, we can thank our fathers. And I'm sure in your own special way, um, kind of think about it, how uh, those little things help us um, as we were growing up. A story is told about a pastor and his wife, Pastor Pat and Mel. Um, they were getting ready to leave the church after the Sabbath worship when they were approached by um, a good friend of them, a couple, uh, George and Lucy, and specifically asked them if they can talk to them in private. Pastor Pat and George are very close friends, and they go way back. When they were starting out their family, they've been friends that long. Soon enough, um, George and Lucy began to unravel a situation about their daughter, Jenny, who just turned 18. From the time she was born, they worked hard to dedicate Jenny's life in serving and glorifying God. Jenny was a beautiful and talented girl, very smart. She plays different musical instruments, very active in church. Pastor Pat even baptized her when she was 12. And as she goes to college and started her um, school, doing research, uh, finding information in the internet, something happened. Something happened that changed Jenny's life. She met Jack in the internet, who is from another state. And soon after, um, he was able to convince Jenny that the life 
that she is living uh, is a life of bondage. That her parents were not providing her the best, the real freedom and the full happiness that she deserves. George and Lucy were totally unaware of Jenny's transformation. It's something that um, parents should take note of. We don't know what's going on uh, with our children if they go into the internet. So it's a good thing to check them once in a while. Okay. In a very subtle way, Jack quickly gained Jenny's trust, and not long after, her attitude changed. She began missing uh, church. Her grades started to go down. And then she stopped seeing her friends in church. George and Lucy tried so hard to discourage um, this relationship, but Jenny continues to communicate with Jack. And then five, year, five weeks later, the church participated in uh, an outreach, in a weekend outreach at another state. Jenny volunteered and told her parents that this will be good for her. And so the parents approved. Instead of attending the outreach, Jenny met up with Jack. That weekend came and passed, and then Monday morning came. Jenny called her father, telling him that she is not coming home. We hear stories like this so often nowadays that really breaks our hearts. It is unfathomable how parents deal with this type of tragedy. The worries, sleepless nights, how life change to those affected by it. Does this remind you of some of a similar story in the book of Genesis? When the devil tempted Eve, and his lies at the Garden of Eden. Her disobedience basically told God that she was living a life of bondage and not free to do as she wanted. As a father, George hired a private investigator to find Jenny. A week later, it confirmed the sad truth that Jenny was living with Jack. Her attitudes and words became coarse and rough as there was a total personality change in Jenny. George pleaded with Jenny to come home so many times, but she always said no. Every day the parents patiently waits for a phone call from Jenny, but it did not come, it did not came. Weeks gone by, and George again talked to Pastor Pat, and he said, I'm planning to rescue my daughter. I have all these things that I'm um, prepared. Are you going to help me? What should a father do to save his child? Some fathers go to extremes just to save their children. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, all glory and praise be yours. We implore the Holy Spirit's presence so we can be cleansed and be a vessel worthy to receive today's message from you, throne of grace. Amen. In our scripture reading, the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray.
pray? A scripture reading answered that question. It is every man's goal to have the character of God, to be a righteous man. Psalms 1, 1 to 3 tells us how righteous man should live. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. We just had a long discussion about scornful at the Sabbath school. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruits, its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. What a, what a wonderful character to have a righteous man. Earthly fathers are especially tasked with critical roles in their family. He must represent God as priests of his home, exercise loving grace, mercy, and justice. They must have the character of God. Man must know the character of God. They must have a close relationship with God. What is the character of God? The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 to 7, when Moses asked the Lord to show his glory, and it says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation? What are some of the character of God? He's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger or patient. Abounding in steadfast love. He never changed. His love never changed. He is forgiving. He's meek and humble. And he is our ultimate provider. Where else can we find God's character? Again, it is in the Bible. The principle of God's character expressed in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 1 to 17, God shows us his true character. Can we memorize the Ten Commandments? What is commandment number five? Amen. Good. Commandment number eight? Thou shalt not steal. Okay. What about commandment number 10? Praise the Lord. Okay. So why did God present this commandment in this way? Why is the first commandment the first? Because he's first? Could God have put the fourth commandment as the first commandment? Sure he could, because he's God, yeah. right? But 
why is the first commandment the first? Because like what some of you said, it is the most important of the commandments. If we consistently obey the first commandment, stay focused on God alone. All our problems currently that we have and will have will disappear. You think about that? If our focus is on God, should we deal with making the wrong decision? Should we make the wrong decisions? No, because God is there to guide us through every step of the way. If we can obey the first, the rest comes easy. Right? And what happened when we disobey God? What is it that transgress the love of God? Yeah. We sin, right? It is Satan's constant effort to represent the character of God. And what does sin do to us? It separates us from God. Let us pause for a while and think about Jesus. Was there a time that Jesus showed hatred in the Bible? Yes? No? No? Yes? Amen. Okay. That is true. There was one time that Jesus expressed his hatred in the Bible. That is found in Jude 23. You remember the saying, love the sinner but hate sin? Okay. That's it. Jude 23 says, Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to steal others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. The second commandment tells us God is a jealous God. Jealous in a positive way, that expresses God's unconditional love towards man. God cannot bear to be separated from man that he made the ultimate sacrifice to redeem us by sending his son to bear our sin. What a wonderful God we serve. Have you ever been invited to a great and joyful gathering with great people, a party like a wedding? Isn't it wonderful to enjoy the occasion, the festivities, food, the company, the place, and everything in it? Can you imagine being in the presence of kings? Well, there is a heavenly gathering God is preparing for all those who love him. Invitations have been sent out and we are all invited. But sadly, many of us delays and even rejects God's invitation to come home in heaven. We come up with excuses such as, I'm busy. My job I have to work hard because I have so much bills. I have to go there because I haven't seen that place. I have to taste this wonderful food. We are busy working to acquire things we think will bring us happiness. But God is inviting us again today. Come home to him in heaven. He's been waiting for thousands and thousands of years 
for each of us to say, yes, I'm coming home. Will you finally reunite with God in that holy city to be with him and all our, loves, uh, our loved ones who accepted the invitation? I pray we will. Okay. Before I close this message, um, let's go back to Genesis story. When George asked Pat if he will help him rescue his daughter, Pat's initial thought was, yes, I will go with you. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. That is what men do. I got your back. Okay. But Pat instead stepped back. And what did he do? He prayed. He prayed intensely, asking God what he should say and do to George. And whatever he says will have an internal consequence on George, Jenny, and his family's life. God answered Paul, uh, Pat's request. And God reminded Pat passage in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 and it says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths God answered Pat's prayers and a few days later Pat talked to George and said, everything we do in this life is to glorify God. In any times, in times of prosperity and in times of difficulties. Pat said to George, what you plan to do will not bring glory to God. I encourage you to pray earnestly. Pray as you have never done before that Jenny will come to her senses and realize that she is headed towards a path of destruction. Pray without ceasing. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Let us remember that when we were training our children, God is there. He is there every step of the way. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. <coughs> Three weeks later, in the evening, late in the evening, George received a call. From Jenny and Jenny said father I'm coming home father I'm coming home what a wonderful words of relief and affirmation George and Lucy felt when they heard those words the next day Jenny came home and with open arms, he welcomed her back. The parable of the prodigal son told by Matt two weeks ago also described how, father, how the father longed and waited for his son to come home. Every day the father waited and waited and waited. One day the son came back. While he was still afar off, his father saw him. The father ran towards the son, embraced him in spite of his filthiness, and commanded the servants to clothe him, the best robe, put a ring on his finger, and a sandal for his feet. In those days, fathers are looked up with respect and authority. 
They do not run even in times of danger because it will reflect fear and bring shame to his family. They do not touch unclean things to maintain their purity. If they do, they are contaminated and infected. The reputation will be smeared and bring shame to their family as well. But our Father in heaven disregarded these traditions and showed his unconditional love to his repentant son. The reason why he clothed the son with his robe was two things. One is to protect his son from the brother or somebody else because what he did was to shame the family and people may get retribution unto him. The other one is a way to show that because of his repentance, Jesus' righteousness covers that sins that he had committed. The reason also why the ring was put on his finger was a sign of getting back his authority. Back in those days, the ring has a signet. Okay? When you have that, it represents authority in the family. And so, The son was lost, but now where is found. Through the prayers of the father, unceasingly, the son finally realized to repent and come home. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Whoever the child of yours had gone away, word, maybe a daughter, a son, nephew, niece, a French child, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing and pray without ceasing. Prayer is the most effective way to communicate with our Father in heaven. The devil trembles when we pray. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Our Father in heaven cares for each and every one of us. He longs to bring us home to the holy city, to be with him and our Savior Jesus throughout eternity. Let us come home. Let us come home.
our Father in heaven. No distance, no time can discourage you and separate you from reaching to us. Your Holy Scripture declared when you created the heavens and the earth, everything is good. But in Genesis 2.18, you said, it is not good for a man to be alone. You really meant this for all men. It is not good that man be separated from you. It is, her, it is us who separates from you, doing our own thing, choosing temporal things in exchange for things that are eternal. Stay close to us, our Father. Keep us always connected to you through prayers and meditation. And we pray, Lord, that you will find us ready when you come and take us home to be with you in that heavenly place where there will be no more pain and no more suffering. That we will celebrate Father's Day every day with you. Father, we long for this day so that our earthly fathers who have gone to rest, we will be reunited with them once again. And forever. 